Right. Um, so today you're doing chapter four, which is about HTML tools um, and kind of how you define I, sort of managing dependencies for a shiny app and mm -hmm. uh, yeah um it's i don't know did did you did, how did you find the chapter as a whole so first thing was it's quite good i mean it's really interesting because there are there's some things i'm doing already that the chapter says kind of or maybe don't do that um so for example, I like to use an external style sheet and I like to manage all my CSS that way. And the book says, well, that's not necessarily the best way to do that in Shiny. Um, and it starts talking about the, the different HTML dependencies functions. Um, and then you, you will still, sorry, you will still point to something else, but you won't do it in the simple way of the tags link style ref, it's better right. to the style sheet. Um, so getting my head around that was was like pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. But it's, Do you think it was it, it was obvious what the benefits of the alternative way of doing it are in in the book? Uh, no, not yet. And I'll admit I was just scrambling out to try to go back in this last like half an hour and stuff to to visit it again and see if I've missed it. But yeah. I put in my presentation like, do you guys have something here to add to this or? Do you, do you guys use the way I do, which is just pointing the style sheet rather than using the, the functions in HTML tools? Um, but it, that was something I definitely personally would like clarification on and to revisit. Okay. Um, right. Uh, should I? Yeah, uh, I'll probably do the introduction then, I guess. Um, right. So, um, so this is chapter four. We're working. This is a, a book club run by the. For those on YouTube, this is a book club run by the Arthur Data Science Community. Um, yes. We're working through a book called Outstanding User Interfaces with Shiny, and uh, Chapter Four is about um, a, a package called HTML Tools and how it can be used to manage things like CSS, HTML dependencies, and stuff within a Shiny app. Um, yes. Okay, so uh, Jack is going to be presenting today, and uh, yeah, if you want to share a screen or or anything, we can get started. Okay, yeah. So um, thought start with a little recap. Um, so I, I actually I caught up on the video, but I missed, couldn't quite catch the end of the last meeting. Um, but in that we see that Shiny has three main dependencies. No, I've just been able to get a booth, so I'm just going to move into a, a meeting booth. Okay, that's that's better. I'm going to be not stopping everyone else working. Um, but we did see in the in the previous book that there are three three main dependencies, and um, those being jQuery, which is like a nice way of managing tags, um, by using I guess like JavaScript not as Lucio's correction was, there's the JavaScript query and then there's jQuery. Um, but it's a nice way of, there's lots of nice things you can do with tags. I think we see later on in the book, he goes through some of the things you can do with jQuery. And um, we've got some of the custom CSS that comes with Shiny, so you get the nice styling. And then we've got the kind of ubiquitous web, web framework of Bootstrap, which does a lot of, a lot of stuff under the hood. Um, but given all these dependencies, um, we may find things that we want to do in the future, like restyle something. Um, and the dependency has already got a styling for that element that we want to restyle. And when we add our independent styling and whatnot, it doesn't actually go through in the app. Or we might find that two dependencies, if we're adding new dependencies, just conflict. And you cannot run your app if you have those two libraries or different parts of the libraries running at the same time. Um, so I try to stick a little bit to what I know best, which is more, more the styling of things when I get overridden by some of the dependencies. Um, but the book does go more into like, well, this package and this package actually just conflict. Um, and it shows us how to deal with some of those things. Um, so here I just put together a, a really simple kind of UI. Um, and what I wanted, what the second image shows is what, you get if you get the HTML of this and you just run it into like um, 
what's it called like the just like a html runner online or something right there's a few different ones and you can see it's kind of ugly um you don't have the nice styling on the button and obviously you do some stuff here with like the margin at the top and you you would edit it a bit but if you if you don't have the shiny dependencies well you get the bottom thing and if you do have the shiny dependencies you get at the top um but one of the things i've found that's because i'm not a web developer and it's all so new to me one of the things i found so difficult in recently styling an app was well okay there are these dependencies and they're do doing stuff and they're executing the code at some point and that's being done after i'm adding my css and stuff and the, the changes i'm making to the css are not being present in my app when i run it um so there are different strategies that you can use to kind of overcome the, the ordering of dependencies um, to add your custom CSS. So like if I wanted to get rid of that blue glow in an app, well, I couldn't use the shiny button unless I also I used the shiny button that did some other cooler stuff with it. Um, and we get three, so we get three main um, kind of strategies for doing this that are presented in the book. And the first one is to use inline styling like this. Um, and this is just for like, like one action button, right? To make it green. And I think you can kind of see that if you had to do this for every element in your, in your UI, well, very quickly, you've got however many lines of code and it's, it's just going to be impossible to manage. It's really hard to read. Um, and it's, it's just generally considered an anti-pattern, right? Um, and yeah, one of the reasons, well, some of the reasons, and I think this is this will be a good place for some of the more experienced web developers and whatnot to dive in and say like add to these reasons why it's bad. Um, but clearly it's gonna be really hard to keep track of everything as the UI just explodes. Um, we're mixing multiple languages in the same document, which, that can be quite a difficult cognitive thing to switch between HTML, CSS, R, um, and if you start adding JavaScript and other stuff in, well, it's going to get more complicated still. It's it's really hard to compartmentalize. Um, we'll inevitably end up just repeating the same bits of code everywhere because they're inline styling. They're not being applied to the app as a, as a whole. And then that just once you build a complex app that just gets super difficult to deal with um and yeah for us it's difficult and we wrote the thing but for someone else joining the app to collaborate with you um to create a nice shiny app well it's just like impossible it just becomes a super web of difficult things um so there is that's what we definitely shouldn't do um does, does someone want to jump in here by the way to add add to this list of why this is bad Uh, well, um, yes, it, finding the place that you need to modify, um, it can be a bit of a challenge when, you know, you could, so that's, that's in line, but that was as if you'd written the CSS in the head element or, or whatever of the, the web page. Mm -hmm. You can additionally, there, there are additional places where you can modify the style of things like by modifying directly on the element in the html code and things which are even worse anti <laughs> um but if yeah if if you as a developer know that the the styling code's all defined in the, the the css and there's a specific place where the css can be found it's a lot simpler to you know know how, how to navigate a project than if you additionally have to know what's going on in the HTML and the things. Awful. <laughs> I don't know. Um, there's probably other things that are wrong with it, but uh, anyway. Yeah, because there's also, right, there's other, like you said, there's other inline places you could do it. Like um, a lot, some of the, and one thing I found personally difficult, some of the shiny elements that are pretty like the action buttons and the different divs or whatnot, they have, um, they take ellipsis and you can pass in the style and it reads that what you pass in as ellipsis says css and it restyles 
or some of them have a style equals object. And in that style equals object, where you start writing some CSS and like, okay, stuff happens. Um, and yeah, I'd probably say doing it, if you do it for every single button like that is, is even worse perhaps than, than this way. Um, but yeah, let's, um, let's have a look at what it says. To submit. I maybe should have edited this next title, but um, what we've got is like choices. Okay, so this one is brushed over that includes CSS. It's a function. I didn't look at it because I've seen it before and I actually remember it not working very well. And then the book just kind of says like, just don't do this. Um, in web development best practices, we would have some kind of sheet like custom.css or styles.css, which goes outside of our R folder and lives in like um, www slash or whether the, the place to put it, you're working with Gollum or different place kind of changes. Um, and then that would, that styling sheet, when you include this code in your UI, well, everywhere in your app, oops, um, everywhere in your app, you'll start to read the CSS from that style sheet. Um, and one of the uh, one of the, the things the, the guy says is like, okay, so, and I've quoted it here, because this is the bit that went a bit beyond my ken, like I recovering the specific dependencies, kind of like what we're learning about now and some of the later things. But at this point, I didn't really know exactly what that would mean. So he says that um, if you use this way, it's not easy to share with other developers and there's no way to recover the specific dependency. So I was, I didn't, I don't have a clear enough mental model to understand what the problem is there and why, why things broke. So I did, I did wonder if anyone could like could grab the bat on there and kind of explain a bit more. I, I'll admit I'm a, I, I'm not entirely certain either, to be honest. Uh, so this, so he's he, referring to a, a custom.css that's embedded in the project that you're working on and suggesting that if it's within that repository, it won't necessarily be available with someone else to be working on it. I don't, I'm, I'm not entirely well, certain I agree, but... Yeah, but I think there are, there are two separate things there, even, even in that little part, right? And he talks about if you're using a content delivery network, and I'm a CDN, so I'm not 100% on what that is. It's like kind of like a web page that is organizing all your CSS and you link to it, yeah. and anyone can just grab that link, right? But then there's if it's a local file and it sits in the right place, um, there was like, in one of the examples later, he talks about, okay, this thing, if you're going to use this choice, it has to be a function because it needs to be executed at runtime rather than when the package is, is made. But he seems to be saying, or the person who wrote the book seems to be saying that there's a different problem with using this method and that that problem is this. Mm -hmm. And... Yeah, maybe maybe something to note down to like yeah, to revisit yeah. um, inside the book, and maybe with a second pass, I'll understand better what what was happening or what was being said. Um, but the the author of the book recommends using the approach where you use these two functions from HTML tools. Um, shall I? Does anyone have anything to add here, or shall I? Should we look at the example that he gives? I'm happy to go ahead. Yeah. 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 Cool. Let's set that as a to do. Um. Okay. And then, oops, I just get this down. Okay. So he presents um these two functions, and what's interesting is like like we're kind of saying, right? It's like it's still linking to some form of style sheet, and to me, this looks very similar. If I go back like to this it, it looks like okay i can spot that there's something else going on um but it's not necessarily clear to me and i think this is just like a naivety and a lack of experience in web development hoping to gain that experience with the part of this book um but he says if so you take the name um we're going to call it uh, whatever we want versions he does briefly go into why 
those things might be important. Um, but we link to what we want and um, yeah, this can be either like a content delivery network or a local folder. Um, and we store the link to it here and we make sure that it's a function so that if this is a local file or if this, yeah, if this is a save file, well, it gets executed when the apps run rather than when the package builds, if you're shipping out a package. Um, so yeah, I, I need to sit with it longer and I'd probably need to build some things that use these different approaches, right? To understand what you actually gain. I, maybe it's just that it's making it explicit by the name of this function. I'm not, I'm not too sure. What, what do you guys think on this bit? I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. I, the, the part of it, I, I imagine, if it, if it was wrapped in a function, then it would be possible to um, um, kind of selectively include it. You know, if, if you were working on a pretty substantial app, then there may be pages that have dependencies that you wouldn't always be opening. So there may not pages, what would you call it? Like tabs within that. Mm -hmm. And by having it as a function, it, you may be able to kind of dynamically determine whether a dependency is included. So, you know, if you've got like some big visualization library or something, it only gets included if the user actually goes onto the relevant tab. I might be missing the. Mm. Well, I think with the, so I think what he was saying about the, the runtime that in the package was kind of like a reactive, right? Um, when you're so I've been doing this thing quite recently with a kind of big app, and one of the things is you've got lots of plots that need to be saved, and the depending on where you feed the reactive through the various modules will determine whether the thing you get is the plot you want after you make changes or the first time the plot's instantiated. And for example, in that plotting function, you need to put in a download box, you need to call the plotting object, which is a reactive, as a reactive at that point. And if you do it before, so when you actually feed it into the function, well, it doesn't behave reactively at all. And you just get the same plot downloaded every time. So I think that thing is to do with a user's file system and he, he, he says something in the book about different OSs, Mac OS, um, I think it was in Windows or something, that I didn't, again, I didn't fully get what was happening, but that seemed to be saying that not doing this will cause problems potentially on different OSs, just according to this little bit here, um, which in the shiny context makes sense to me because rate reactives are basically functions right and it's just checking when it needs it that this link or this these files are there um but what what i think i'm not getting that perhaps you are russ if that if that's the bit you're worried about it's like what what's what's actually changed right like what's actually more helpful here um yeah, I don't. I couldn't couldn't figure it out yet. Um, oh, sorry, am I are you muted, Russ? Or I, I was just now, but um, yeah, I was. I, there is a. I mean, there's the possibility that that um, if you are if you are packaging up something for use in multiple shiny apps so it, it may be something that like includes its own web dependencies then this html dependency thing i could see why it would be valuable you know if you know like last year we were doing the javascript with our book club and and you know um if you've written a wrapper package for some you know, geographical map, 
JavaScript library or something by defining the location and, and, and whatnot of that using this HTML dependency function. Um, it means that when someone includes your package, the, the Shiny app can kind of determine incompatibilities between, you know, if, if your app's using one version of that library already, that JavaScript library already, and you're trying to include a second possibly incompatible version of it, um, HTML dependency is able to identify that kind of conflict. But um, I don't know. You know, in the setting, what the the the, the value is, if if mm -hmm. if this is something embedded in in the repository for your app, I'm not sure what the benefit is. But yeah, yeah, I mean, I, maybe it will become clearer, right, as as we go on or as we see different different examples. Um, but I guess following on from that, so he recommends this approach, um, this approach, right, but then we kind of continue a bit and he points out that even if you do this approach, well, the the X, the order of execution of the various dependencies might determine that this styling sheet you've added gets executed before another styling sheet. And when you run your app, well, it, it's that styling sheet styling that takes over. And um, yeah, okay. Um, so, yeah, he says, I'm just going to minimize something on my screen. And um, right now, given that Shiny adds so many dependencies, well, you still don't have control over like where your own in, your dependencies will be inserted. So you you haven't controlled yet that your styling takes precedence over all of the styling that may be present in the various dependencies. Um, and you know, it's in the book that, well, we'll skip to four in, in 4.3, which is one of the latest sections of the book. We'll cover that. And then he kind of segues into um, importing additional or um, specific dependencies from a various package. Say, for the example that he gives is that uh, a lot of people use the Shiny Dashboard package. And if you wanted to get the shiny dashboards, shiny dashboard packages style of box. Um, one way you could do it is you could make everything a dashboard and you just have this import all of the dependencies and then you've got this dashboard layout. Um, but if you want to get that kind of style, well, without getting all those dependencies and without using a dashboard layout, well, you need to identify the precise dependencies of that element that are brought in when when the app loads and then you can inject those into your own app and you can get that nice um, box style but without the dashboard layout and the the function to do this is another html tools function and it's the find dependencies function um, so yeah as it says we can using this we can make an app so we get build like a kind of empty dashboard um, and we can then use find dependencies in this empty dashboard kind of thing and we can extract them all and what he says is there, there are a bunch more there are four different um, lists here so he only prints one just for space but you can start to see that there are different things in here um, that you might want somehow to, to add to your own dashboard box. Um, so like the, the way he does this is like you make your own function, which is using the box function and use tag list, which is really helpful, shiny function. And you just add these dependencies that you found here. Um, and you just inject them into just this box. And now this box has the dependency and your whole app does not. Um, whereas if you did it, so let's go back to, to this one, let's do this one. 
here now this one if you were to do it in here or something and you give it to your whole app and now your app's going to be a dashboard and you didn't want that so instead you keep it into the scope of just this box by ensuring that it's in this box's tag lists um it's uh i really like the idea um I wonder, given the way I've explained it, does it make that much sense to anyone else? Or is it just that like, it seems to make sense in my head? What, what do you guys think about like this way of injecting the dependencies? Federica, do you want to, or um, anyone else in the room? Um, so yeah, uh, I think that's, that's uh quite straightforward so you can like um, function and then call it um but um so then then you need to specify the variables and when what happened when this the the the, the variables changes of type or things you need to specify i think um, yeah what type of variable are uh, expected within the function? Does it make sense? Yeah, well, so he uh, does give the dummy code here later on of like when you're actually calling it inside your app. Um, you should include these, right? Um, and that would be it. Those would be the only arguments they take, which I'm not actually familiar with this, this function. Um, if I switch screen to R, you guys are not going to come with me, are you? Like I'm currently just sharing. Um, Possibly not, no. Um, if yeah, you, okay. Yeah. yeah, well, I won't do that. Um, you may be able to share your whole um, screen rather than just a, a window, but... Um... Yeah, if I... If I um just end the sharing quickly and I go back in and we just share this. Okay, so I've got various different or oh, this is my one from here. If I kill this, let's see this one. Um don't want any of this, but <laughs> let's say shiny dashboard and we've got box. Uh and we take a little look at well there, yeah interesting because i guess he's just showing um just showing a really basic example right of how you could do something like this if you wanted to but yeah. presumably if you wanted to start dealing with all the arguments that it takes and have the box functioning as normal well you'd want to make sure that your function takes ellipsis so from so in here, this function takes ellipsis and that is passed into box so that you could do all of the um of these things, the background, the height, collapse or and all this stuff. Um but was was that was that kind of what the question was getting at, or have I missed missed the force of the question? Yeah, what, what that that was a set of questions. Do, do you need to put like warnings and say, I don't know, things when when you, how do you do to make sure that uh, things go right when you put a function inside? <laughs> hmm. um, hmm. And so yeah. up inside another function, so. Do you need to put any warnings? How do you work out those warnings? Is this uh, the case? Uh, so, like adding in additional logic, kind of like at this point, but before this, to check that the inputs are of the right kind of uh, like those kind of warnings um, that these are the right data types or argument types or do we mean some warnings that would go 
as the app's being built. Because um, I will be honest and just say, I, I don't know. And perhaps he covers it in the book, but I didn't see it. I didn't pick up on it. Um, so yeah. yeah. What, what do you think? Uh, or anyone, anyone else, but for us, if, if no one else. Um, uh, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I, one, one of the things that I, I vaguely recall about HTML dependency that's quite interesting is that, that um, it, if you had multiple calls to my dashboard box in your app, um, you've got multiple um, uses of that dashboard dependencies value. And, but you only end up with at most one, and, and you think if, had you coded that up naively, you might end up with several different downloads from that content delivery network. Whereas what actually happens with HTML dependency is it, it, it kind of maintains knowledge of, of what other dependencies have been um embedded into the app and will only add the the additional dependencies if they aren't already present um so you don't end up with multiple downloads of the thing um i don't know so much about um you know precisely what kind of data validation type stuff you might need to put in a function like this but maybe it's maybe for a more um feature full UI component then then maybe it may be something important to, to look into. But, um anyway, um sorry. Uh so the dummy mm -hmm. app, what's this? <laughs> well this was this was from from the book. Um so I just popped in the code that he had used and you could see I could yeah I guess I could get this now couldn't I because we've done this. So if let's just comment this out. But we've got this now you can see you got you got the nice box um mm. and it has this like top styling um and yeah i mean i would say you probably want a little bit of padding or something there or margin or something right um but yeah this is the nice which i guess he's he's really just showing you like and yeah. I think it says in the book, like you've now got like an endless list of possibilities that you can you can develop, yeah. right? Yeah. But here's one cool one. Now I did wonder about this. Um when I saw it, right, I did think, is this not just inline styling? Um like to do this properly, I <laughs> Is it, I guess it's it's not that we're doing it properly or not, but it does seem like this should go in a in a custom.css or styles.css, and it should apply to whatever yeah. class and stuff this dashboard box is. So I, I guess we could actually, as like a fun um, thing, we could reload that app, and we could just have a look at like the inspect, see the I guess it dot box header. But it's got some stuff. Now, where is that Gainsborough thing that's been added? It's the background um, color of the page, I think. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, why would uh, I'm just going to change it just to see what it would actually look like? But why would this not fit? Um, yeah. Okay. That looks disgusting. Um, but... <laughs> yeah. I, I, maybe you know. Uh, so is it Arthur or James Arthur? Uh, both. <laughs> cool, because I was going to say I've been calling you Arthur for like the longest time. Yeah, no, time, I, I, I go by Arthur, but yeah, yeah. Uh, cool. Um, yeah, do you know like why this little bit of rogue styling in this example would be here? Um, or is this just that he's maybe showing a different point, right? He's not. Yeah, I I feel like it might have been better had he had he, had he made a point with like the like uh, the external style sheet like I that that would have been nice if you'd had that one little bit there so you could kind of see that you know 
style is coming from two places. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I got tripped up on that myself as I was reading through through the through the chapter. Yeah, it, I, uh, to be honest, it it might be to have put that in a a second CSS file might have been kind of heavy handed for the example. I don't I don't know whether that does that make sense. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, for for sure. And and certainly what you can see in in that app is that the 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 style import code goes into two different places in the app if you look in that inspection um should thing. i get it? should i leave this open or do i oh yeah so there you're you've got the um the background colors defined in the body of the app whereas the mm -hmm. imports of things like what would they be the dashboard the shiny dashboard dependencies have all got imported as part of the head of the app. Yeah, what's in here, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah you got... can see at the bottom the shiny dashboard dependencies mm -hmm. have all got pulled in. And and that, in some ways, that's quite surprising because you expect that the, the UI components that you're writing um, should map to elements of the body of the app. It's certainly that's how it works when you're writing individual elements, but the actual imports that they bring in come mm. at a different place. Yeah, interesting. Because I, I, I kind of said slash thought the whole point was that this didn't come into the whole app, but it has. Mm. It, it has, but I, I mean, I, honestly, Jack, I was kind of tripping over this as I was reading the the, the section. I was like, how, how how do you, I mean, does this indeed kind of, constrain the scope like using html dependencies is does it actually constrain the scope of the css to to the element itself i mean so i guess you're like in the head you're clearly bringing in the the, the style sheet right but mm -hmm. i'm wondering if in the element itself like the component in the page like somehow i don't know is like inlining it for us so if, if i could put it that way so like somehow the this the scope the scope of like, like let's imagine we have you know uh some css rules that in different style sheets that, that pertain to the same elements right mm -hmm. um and i guess one resolution is like whichever comes last will, will dominate i guess you know if they're equal levels of specificity but I'm, I'm kind of wondering like how 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 indeed does it work that like the css targets the element so i'm kind of blathering here but yeah but there's a so i don't want to skip ahead too much because there's like i have a very fragmented knowledge of all this stuff and like i learn little bits and hopefully they will start to get together but when thing when multiple things like try to style the same um element right so say if it's like button uh, or button warning then if none of them have the like exclamation mark important tag it will just be the one that's executed last, right? So it would, or I think, of course, it would yeah, be, yeah. it would kind there's, of be like this one. Um, there's uh, the 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 rules are a little bit more advanced than that. There's um, because if you have a styling rule in that final CSS that has low specificity, which means like if it could apply to every paragraph element in the app or something like that. Mm -hmm. Whereas in an earlier style sheet, you have a um, styling rule that applies to paragraphs with a, with a very specific identifier, uh, sorry, with other classes or with mm -hmm. a, a particular identifier. The one that came first will be used because it's more specific to a particular element. So it's probably not a good example. If your button here was given an identifier and you had um, the um, dashboard styling was being imported at the very last, uh, as the very last CSS, but in the mm -hmm. very first CSS, you had a rule that said, um, 
anything with the identifier my my box will have a green background that rule will come first because it, that rule will be the one that applies even if there's a rule in the final css file that's that would otherwise apply to the button but it's not as specific say it applies to anything of class button but not necessarily to the specific it, <laughs> There's a lot of rules. Yeah, but, so yeah, would so, it be so if the, yeah. if there was a, a kind of matching score of you know two different uh, styling rules, the one that came last would win. But if there's a more mm -hmm. specific rule that came earlier in the cascade, that would be the one that applied to any particular element. So would it be like um, just because I think I kind of I think I get the idea, but with the, got the actual like real, real thing of it. But say if you hadn't here, like say, cause I really can never remember any of these. I say, this is this. Um, and then you were to add in here. So this is box and this is going over all of the boxes, like, or it's trying to, but this mm -hmm. box happens to have another class, which is box danger. And it's like, if you added in here, um, another class. So I really hate not using a mouse. Oh. It's not going <laughs> to, why can I not just add another thing? Okay. But well, this is frustrating. Um, but so if I were to add a color, right, into here, that's mm -hmm. like, there we go. Um, and it was a different one to this Alice blue. So I go and aqua. Um, would the box danger, like, take this color? Because box dot box danger is more specific than box. It should be, and I'm not entirely certain why it's not worked, but um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, I guess color there is. There is quite, there's good, I mean, there's good documentation. The, the Mozilla website has some really good details about this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so you can assume from the stuff on the right hand side that dot box, dot box danger comes earlier than dot box in the CSS file, even though it's been minified and everything's on the same line. Um, but um, because you've got uh, two classes, both of which match the box that you've got on the left-hand side there, that yeah. rule binds more specifically to it gets that. gets cancelled out. Box. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, it seems like it just doesn't let me actually add this. Um, and I, get, I would guess that's because it's in here. Um, mm. So, like, before that I had this, if we take this out, oops, then mm -hmm. now it does do this. Um, let's get black, because black so, so is I think pretty easy. The, I think with the strike through, it's basically like saying that it exists as a rule in that class, but you know, um, it gets overridden by the other, like it shows you like what's actually being applied. I, or at least that's my, yeah. my understanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. That seems to make, make quite a lot of sense. And the conflict would be, right, if you, had somewhere else like dot box dot box danger and there's a different background color that's trying to be applied well that might be over right overridden by like the order of execution according to how how these things like which style sheet is being read in but that's i guess hopefully that's something in the later chapters where it's like it tries to teach you everything you need for css i i would say hopefully this stuff all becomes more clear but i think that was a really helpful explanation russ about like and i guess arthur you alluded it to as well about the specificity and it not being just a case of the order of execution um okay i'm gonna nip back into here and by this point it was so long that i was getting quite quite pressed for time when i was making the slides so i i did essentially end up copying just most of the book right um but one of the and let's say you've imported your different dependencies uh, for your dashboard box and touch wood, you kind of managed to avoid the problem of getting all of the dependencies, um, which again, I'm not sure that we did looking at the style sheet, but say if you, you didn't want to, or there are some of Shiny's dependencies, right? And Bootstrap is one of them. Well, 
you need to do um, conflicts with bootstrap dependency. And the example he gave in the book is this semantic page thing. And it's from some of the Epsilon kind of shiny stack, which personally I'm not, not familiar with, but this shiny dot semantic. Well, he says like, um, those two are incompatible, like they conflict. So if you're building something, say with semantic page, you'd add, you would use the HTML tool suppress dependencies function to remove the bootstrap and dependency from the shiny app. And you could do it like this. So I guess they make their own custom function. They have an argument as to whether you suppress the bootstrap or not. And yeah, if it's, if you do suppress the bootstrap, well, okay, suppress, suppress bootstrap becomes this, which is this suppress dependencies and then bootstrap in speech marks. Otherwise it's nothing. And then down here in your tag list, but in the scope of tag list, rather than in the scope of tags head, I think just by looking at it. Yeah, I think so in the scope of um, tag list rather than tags head, you have tags body and you include the suppressed bootstrap thing. And what that would do is that would mean that your app can run now because you don't have that conflict between the shiny semantic stuff and the bootstrap stuff. Um, one thing that occurred to me when I was reading this was what happens like when you don't really know which dependencies right that you want to get it's kind of just a case of like playing inspector or something right like you just have to i guess inspect the page route through all the various like um style sheets and just try to find the place that there is this conflict which if you're kind of like a beginner to this kind of stuff html css to me that seems like that's the harder problem than doing this yeah, um, yeah. I don't know what I don't know if you guys found that or have any tips for that kind of thing. I I understand what you mean. So, for example, if if you weren't aware that semantic was in conflict with Bootstrap, and you included the two dependencies in something, and found that when you're uploaded, some buttons that you thought should look like they do under the semantic template actually look like they do under the Bootstrap template. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it, you wouldn't necessarily know that there was even a, a conflict between those two dependencies anyway. So working out why your buttons just look wrong uh, mm -hmm. could be quite challenging. But I think the dev tools are, are quite useful for, for that kind of thing. So you can select the particular button or title or whatever it is that's styled in incorrectly you can find out mm -hmm. where its css rules are coming from and hopefully you'd be able to work out that you know they're coming from the bootstrap css rather than the semantic css or something but i i, I must admit that could end up being a, a huge mesh of possible conflicting dependencies that it might be quite hard to tease out um mm -hmm. yeah yeah, yeah and it's, it's like point. Yeah. you'd um you'd need to like okay we've got the mental model now that there can be this conflict this conflict and stuff but you'd really have to investigate around. and i wonder if there is like a better way oh no a better way like a function that tells you like you might have these clashes or because you you were doing a bit of text mining or something over various css sheets you could find places that have these um clashes so i would guess there is probably a function or some stuff like automated stuff that could help i just don't know what it is or yeah so i, I guess for now we're kind of stuck and it's actually i will say i personally find it really fun going because i I'm not used to it, but I think in, oh, it's not going to like that, is it? Um, thought I had the actual book open, but I was copying some of like the, you know, the tips and the flashes and, and the little boxes and the styling. I was putting those into my own apps just by reading this book and then inspecting. And it's, it's like, it's a pretty fun, like pastime, but it might get really tricky if you need to do it under any sort of pressure. 
Um, but one thing that it then does is say like this, this thing. Now this is quite overwhelming, certainly I think if you don't know what's going on. Um, whereas this one, this example where he says, okay, um, we're gonna remove like the specific admin LTE de dependency from the dashboard stuff. And like, this is how you do it. Um, which, yeah, it's pretty cool. One thing I didn't check is like, okay, dashboard body. So is this shiny, oops. Oh. What's the, sorry, what's the package word? Is it not shiny dashboard? Wait, I, I want this then. I Shiny dashboard, right? And then dashboard body. So what I didn't look at is, well, why does this allow you to, uh, okay, it's because it takes ellipsis. Um, so this stuff is just, yeah, this thing being fed into the person who needs to know about it. And you just don't really need to know who that person is necessarily. But if you wanted to, items to put in the dashboard body. So uh, is that <laughs> is that a little bit of like, I have this tendency to do this in my documentation too, but like that doesn't necessarily tell you like where it's being sent or how it's being dealt with, um, which if you did maybe want to know, you might want a little bit more context than this. Was there, was there something you wanted to, to jump in with there, Russ? No, not at all. Well, I, I would say though that this is, it's quite, quite common in, in, in shiny developments to have that ellipsis where you add whatever tags it is that you need to to add um so it's it, it, i imagine it could be fr quite frustrating if you don't if you're not used to shiny but that's quite common in the um uh, but yeah um yeah so i don't have mm. yeah well I, I think like normally it would say though right like uh, an action button or something if there's ellipsis it'll say like ellipsis enter css because it gets fed that's what's happening like enter some css code in a string or, or just like css it'll kind of tell you what you should or could put in there and maybe where it will go but I, yeah i guess if you're used to it maybe it's quite a bit easier um but in theory what this would do if you were to run this app so shall we just run this app um if we go looking for admin lte it does eventually load i'm not sure but it's going to if it hasn't already um this is an interesting way now because normally you just do this don't you you assign ui server but it's calling the shiny app with it all in line and doesn't actually oh in the book didn't he say you'll notice that you get blank example that might be my my bad there um okay let's let's uh let's take that as red for now and that i suppose we can all eventually figure out how to get rid of this individual dependencies that we want there's a different function um and this function is more i suppose um like what you might actually want to do right um and like it says here, there's a function and in HTML tools resolve dependencies, and it will remove redundant dependencies for you, which is perhaps similar to what I was saying before about like calling out conflicts. Um, but we can just get rid of all of the things that we don't necessarily need using using the resolve dependencies. Do the same trick, we find the dependencies that we want, and then we get rid of the ones that we don't need. Um, but this would be this would be something that personally I, I want to build something with it to fully understand. Or like, what did I just do? And why is why is this so so kind of useful? Um, and I guess it's just a case of like avoiding conflicts where you can. Um, but does someone who's with a bit more kind of experience have have more context on this.
Anyone? I, I guess I can kind of see the motivation for this, but I've never dealt with it personally. I, I don't know if anyone else has. No, I've never needed to use resolve dependencies, but um, yeah. I, so this this would typically be something that that, that that kind of runs under the hood, though. I imagine if you if you've if you've built an app that doesn't necessarily use every type of slide or every type of button that Shiny provides for you, then Shiny may intelligently drop some of the dependencies. Um, but I don't, just guessing, really. I, I mean, I don't, mm. I don't. But isn't that a different use case, Russ? I, I mean, uh, I think mm, I think here yeah, for yeah, this yeah. section, it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. you've got two um, two versions, I guess, in this case of Font Awesome, and you just want to take the, the higher version. So I think it's sort of resolving the, con the dependency conflict by taking the greater version, unless there's a, yeah, yeah, look this up. Right. unless unless there's some argument in this function that allows you to make other choices. Uh, yeah, take the lower version. Mm. And what what would the scope though be here? This is like. I'm guessing it's so I'm guessing it's global. Uh, that, that that kind of comes back to I don't know one of my hesitancies about this whole whole chapter a little bit is like is is all of this global or is anything kind of <laughs> more specific? Yeah, that's something that like yeah we've we've mentioned I guess a couple of times now, but I didn't get the feeling it was clear, fairly stated in the book, and it could be that that's you know that's our bad for missing it. Um, but that might be something that's interesting to, as a to do as well, is to to try to figure out independently of the book, or if you want to just provide local scope for these things, can you? And if you can, how do you do it? And can you do it with these functions that we've been introduced to here, um, like the the various HTML dependency functions? Because um, yeah, I again, I kind of just figured that it was. It was like I'm kind of experienced in this realm, so I wasn't picking up on stuff. Um, but perhaps it's it's not there. Cool. There is actually so if we get the thing, there is actually another chapter, isn't there? The sub chapter. Oh, no, it's not the standing user unleash shiny. There is this further section um but i was kind of lost enough here and here that i was like, i'm gonna leave this if we need to so that the next person could maybe come along and sweep up the confusion <laughs> that i will have happened to create or not been able to resolve um so yeah that's maybe a some, something to call out um because i was kind of lost by by the end here um, okay i mean we can discuss that in the slack channel and and whatnot if there's uh, some additional bits of the chapter that are of interest yeah yeah cool cool um yeah it, uh, i i must admit I, I there's bits of it that I, I i i i didn't see the the i i didn't feel particularly convinced that HTML dependency was as important as the author's trying to get across. And I, I, maybe that's my own kind of not having worked through enough conflicts at the front end. Um, but uh, yeah, um, but thanks for, for taking us through it. Uh, yeah. Um, so um, yeah, I don't know. Do you have any closing thoughts on the whole um Clay, I, I think you've just summed up how I felt too. And I just assumed that my not being convinced is ignorance. Um is like I haven't grasped what he's saying because I don't have the experience in different things. It would be nice to get a few a, a couple more things. Because there there's normally there's one example, and sometimes it's like a really short example, but some more examples of like, well, here's the the web dev's best way of doing it or like the, the best practices right for the for that style sheet well if you do that 
in this example, like, here's the trouble you run into down the line. And this is why you don't do that. Um, Because it did feel like you just kind of got to take the word for it. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good to see things fail sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But overall, it's a a really good chapter. I thought it was a pretty challenging one. I think there's still a lot I need to digest personally. So that's the kind of stuff that I think you want to read, right? It's the stuff that you you didn't already know. So I thought it was good. Um, Yeah, that's that's my my closing okay great um thanks for taking us through it then um next week we have uh i think it's the round off of this section of the book so it's chapter five on and it, it's called web application concepts or something along them lines federica's taking us through that um which would be to be honest quite a nice kind of overview of um a, f- a few of the things that we're going to be talking about in in later sections of the book so um yeah yeah looking forward to that um that'll be next week um we are now past the time zone conflicts and things like that so we should be back to a, a fixed time for at least the next five months anyway um great lovely to see you all and thanks for taking us through that chapter uh, jack so uh, i'll see you all next week and Feel free to chat in the Slack channel about anything in this chapter or in coming ones as well. Um, yeah. Cool. Nice one. See, see you next week, guys. Have a nice week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.